I knew there would be trouble when they walked into the bar. Not physical, like getting somebody's bum whipped, but emotional trouble. I didn't want to hear it. Up until a few months ago, I would have considered them friends. Even when things went to hell, if they had just kept their mouths shut, they would have been fine. The ones who found out about her affair, I dropped like a rock, making it very clear they were no longer my friends. Of course, they tried to argue. They didn't want to take sides. They hoped she'd figure out it was destructive behavior. She still loves you, blah, blah, blah. That didn't cut it with me. And I told them so. It took a couple of meetings and some pretty intense confrontations before they realized I was serious. To this day, if one comes up and tries to talk, I either turn my back or leave. I think they finally got the point. The few others I still associated with got the point and made sure they didn't mention her. If they did by accident, I simply excused myself and left. It had been six months, the paperwork filed, the statements given. My offer of a 50-50 split was more than fair, and it was almost done. She was fighting tooth and nail. We tried arbitration, but they gave up when neither of us would budge. Mostly, they talked to her, trying to get her to see she was getting a really good deal. Then she hit me with counseling. I refused, telling the judge it would be a complete waste of everyone's time and money because there was no way I'd reconcile. The judge, listening to an emotional borderline hysterical Becky, threatened me with jail. I was shocked when I said, All right, just tell me when to turn myself in. If you're that positive this marriage can't be saved, beyond the shadow of a doubt, to use a term you'll easily understand, I will not, let me stress that, will not ever be living with or have a relationship with her for the rest of my life. We have no children. Since this started, we have had very few friends in common. My business partner and his wife helped her carry on and conceal the affair, so I'm through with them. Divorcing her will be just a tiny ripple in the big pond of life. Clear enough for you. I may have overstated it, and she decided to test my resolve. I spent three weekends in jail before she finally understood I was willing to keep going indefinitely and dropped counseling. They were on a mission. You could see it in the eyes of the women. The men just looked uncomfortable. I knew they weren't there by accident. The bar was in another town, 25 miles away. I told my new favorite bartender I didn't care for the quality of people in my old one. She was pretty shrewd, in her mid-forties, and had pretty much seen it all. She managed to get the story out of me in bits and pieces, usually waiting until I'd had at least four beers. She had been married to the same man for twenty-one years, and they owned the bar. What I loved most about her was she never offered an opinion, even though I could see she wanted to. Finally, one night, I told her to speak her mind, but only this once, never to be broached again. I wanted her to get over wondering about it. When we were done, she just looked at me for a little while. Obviously, I've only heard your side of the story. It might be fantasy, but I don't think so. You were probably right to leave, but you might want to let her give you her side of the story. I'm sure you've wondered how it all went down the tubes. It might do you some good. It might not. It may make you even more angry. Still, human nature being what it is, it might help you to hear her out. It's up to you. The next beer is on me. God, I love this woman. A mother figure who'd feed you all the alcohol you wanted for a price if you gave her your keys first. She knew something was up the minute they walked in and saw my face turn to stone. Friends, she said, nodding to them. I don't know, I answered truthfully. Guess I'm about to find out. Don't do anything stupid, she warned. Just give me a look, and I'll run them out of here. It took them ten minutes to work up the nerve to say anything. Todd walked up and stood beside me. Hey, Jace, how you doing? I'm fine. The family's fine. Everybody is fine. Cut to the chase, Todd. What do you want? My little speech, delivered with no emotion, shook him a little. Me and the boys. He nodded at his two friends. We don't really want to do this. But Becky has them all bummed out, crying over what? In a hole you're being over something she's sorry about, 
and you won't forgive her for. You remember being married. Hell, technically, you're still married. And they won't let it go. So we found out where you were, and here we are. Will you talk to them? If I say no, tell them to cram Becky up their collective rear ends, and leave me the heck alone. He colored a little but kept on. It would probably hurt all their feelings, and they'd come after you anyway. Please, Jace. I let him stew for a minute. All right, but remember what I told Jeff and Angela, Bob and Gloria. It still applies. I do this, we're through. Don't bother looking me up again. Understand. I think he got a little angry, like I gave a darn. I understand. Man, what a hard case you've turned into. Now, will you talk to them? Yes. Let me ask you something before you go. If it was your wife fooling around, would you let it go? He gave me a smirk. That'll never happen. She loves me. Yeah, Becky said the same thing. Still does. Didn't stop her, now did it? He frowned before I continued. First, go tell Sandy and George what I said, and then have them come over here and tell me they understand. They might not be as soft as you are. Then tell the girls I'll give them ten minutes, no more, so they better be sure about what they say right off the bat, because they'll never get a second chance. I figure I'll have time to enjoy another beer by then. I turned away, dismissing him. He stood for a second, head hanging, before he went back to the table. I watched in the mirror as their heads jerked up and a heated discussion started. Sandy threw up his hands and walked over to me. I've always liked you, Jace. You don't deserve this. I'm a little ashamed of the whole thing and I'm out. I apologize for bothering you, but Tina is determined. We're going to have a long talk on the way home. This is the last time I'm going to put up with her meddling. I guess this is goodbye. He held out his hand. I shook it. So long, Sandy. You're one of the good ones. If I ever come back to town, I might look you up, not Tina, though. George never really liked me much, so he had no problem. The women watched me like hawks. I made them wait a little while before, mentally girding my loins, walking into the lion's den. I sat down, and they started talking. I held up my hand, got out my phone, and set the timer for ten minutes. I could tell it really upset them. All right. You're on the clock. Tina rolled her eyes. Really, Jace? A timer. Nine minutes and forty-nine seconds, I said. They talked over each other for a minute before they realized their mistake and looked at Carrie. Apparently, she was to be the spokesperson. I know this is really none of our business, but... They almost ran when I slammed my hand down hard on the table. Finally, somebody understands. You're right. It's none of your business, and you'd be well served to stay out of it. But you can't resist, can you? You're determined to talk sense into me because you're our friends, right? Then where the heck were you when she was out fooling around with someone else? Where was your concern for me then? One word from any of you to either of us would have saved me a lot of grief. We wouldn't even be here now. But looking back, I can't recall you or any of our so-called friends ratting her out. Heck, a lot of you gave her alibis. End of rant. Let me reset the timer. They all sat there stunned before Carrie spoke up. She sounded annoyed. Jace, please. It was a mistake. She never meant for it to happen. We didn't know what to say. She's miserable. Her parents hardly ever talk to her anymore. Her boss has her on probation. She cried when she found out you'd saved her job. I think she's learned her lesson. Time to swallow your stubborn pride and take her back. I rolled my eyes. I'm sorry I didn't read the unfaithful wife cheating handbook. I wasn't aware there was a time limit on how long I was allowed to be angry. So now it's okay. Fine. Kiss kiss, promise promise, and we live happily ever after. Not hardly. You know, I'd be a lot calmer if you people wouldn't keep shoving her in my face. Still think you know what's best for us. They actually looked a little guilty before nodding. Yes, you all feel that way. I looked around the table, and they all nodded their heads again. They babbled for a few more seconds, but I stopped them. Hold on, 
Let's go off the clock for a second here. Carrie, if you found out George was fooling around on you, and all of us knew and didn't tell you, would that be all right? Or if the spouse was found out, would they eventually be forgiven? You love him that much. She frowned but said, I would eventually. And if the person he was fooling around with was someone you knew, a friend even, married to a friend, could you forgive them? She looked definitely uncomfortable. They all suddenly seemed very nervous. I'd like to think I would after a time if I thought they were really sorry. I grinned. Well, that's great because Jan and George have been fooling around for about eight months now. In fact, when I heard the rumors about you guys, I didn't believe them. Before you ask, I was going to tell you what I'd heard, but other things came up that required my attention. I left it alone because I thought you deserved to find out on your own, like I did. By then, I didn't give a darn about any of you anyway. It's why I moved here. I heard they had a better class of jerks. So take your pious, hypocritical platitudes and shove them up your collective rear ends. I stopped, breathing heavily. There was dead silence around the table. So let the healing begin. That way we can all get over it. Carrie, tell Jan you forgive her. Jan, in four months, you can promise her you won't fool around again. And everything will be fine. You'll have a stronger marriage for it. I'm pretty sure that's in a chapter of the cheating handbook somewhere. I stopped to catch my breath. Let's get Todd and George over here too and do a blanket healing. And Carrie, don't throw too many stones or I'll have to tell an interesting tale about you and a dancer during your last girl's weekend in Myrtle Beach. Did I mention Becky told tales when she was drunk and we were alone? Tina, you and Sandy need a new circle of friends. Looks like the old one is pretty worn out. We finished our conversation about me and Becky, but it looks like you guys have a lot to talk about, so I'll be leaving now. Let's not do this again. Ever. Bye. Was it a crummy thing to do? Maybe, but it didn't bother me much. He without sin, and so on. There was a heck of a row at the table, lots of yelling, tears, and more than a few slaps. Sandy grabbed Tina and they went to another table. He wasn't loud but had a finger in her face, and she was crying pretty hard. Finally, Marge, the bartender, told them to either leave or tone it down. They trooped out, all but Tina and Sandy. She timidly came up to me. I'm sorry, she said with her head lowered and avoiding eye contact. Then she gathered her courage and looked up. It's just that we thought you were the best of us. You guys seemed really happy. I didn't believe it when you split up, and I figured once you calmed down you'd talk it out and get back together. I'm guessing everyone, especially Becky, didn't expect your reaction. You're really through with her, aren't you? Yes, Tina, I am. You're wrong, though. You and Sandy are the best of us. Use this as a learning experience. Choose your friends a little more carefully in the future. Go home now, love each other, and if nothing else, Remember me and Becky and how you can never be sure of anything, especially how a person will react to cheating. Maybe I'll see you sometime. Sandy apologized again, and they left holding hands. Marge nodded towards them as they left. They seemed like a decent couple. The others, though, I'm not so sure of. I think the divorce court in your hometown will be a little busier soon. I nodded in agreement, then gave her my keys, $30 for the cab and switched to whiskey. I was as surprised as any of them at my reaction. I like to think I was a pretty decent guy, and still do. Then again, you never know how someone will react to stress and cheating. The fact that I loved her so deeply made the cheating even worse. I wasn't really attracted to Becky at first. She flirted too much and seemed a little flighty to me. We didn't date for the first two years I knew her. She was the best friend of my business partner's wife. Cindy was the one constantly trying to put us together. Give it a rest, Cindy. We're just not attracted to each other. Speak for yourself. I know for a fact she's interested in you. You'd be good for her. Being half-busted, I smiled and kissed her cheek. But dear Cindy, would she be good for me? She left it alone for about six months. Then Alan, my partner, asked me for a favor. 
Jace, I hate to spring this on you so late, but all of us, Cindy, Becky, and her date, are going to the theater tomorrow to see Mamma Mia. I know how much you love musicals, you closet fan. Becky and her boyfriend had a big fight, and they broke up. Would you go with us and keep her company? I thought about it for a minute. Don't think so. I don't think I'd enjoy it in the company of a weepy or angry woman. And you're the one who picked the show. It's all you've talked about for two weeks. Have you picked which dress you're going to wear? It's after Labor Day, so the white four-inch heels are out. Go with the black five-inch come-screw-me pumps. Maybe Cindy will get excited enough to use the ten-inch strapping new size queen. We laughed and went back to work. That evening, Cindy called. Please, Jace, she's a mess right now. She could use the company of a decent man. But I don't need the company of an emotional woman. She'll behave, I promise. Please, please, please. I sighed. All right, but just because I want to see the show. In gratitude, tell Alan you'll use the strapping. If he's a good girl, he'll understand. You jerk. Now I have to buy some scented lube on the way home. Cherry if they have it. We laughed for a minute while I tried to get a mental picture. Alan was 64 with a beard. Cindy might be 53. Seriously, dude, thanks. If tonight sucks, I'm going to take a turn on you with that strapping. Now, let's get to work. We went to dinner first. Becky was subdued, but not whiny. I really looked at her for the first time. She was fifty-seven, slender, but she had world-class curves. Her auburn hair went to her shoulders in soft curls. Her face was well-proportioned, with brown eyes that sparkled most of the time, and a mouth that seemed to say, Kiss me now. Altogether, she was a very nice package. The problem was, she knew it and used it. I'd seen her work a guy, and the poor guy never had a chance when she turned on the charm. Then she'd laugh and walk off, leaving him hanging. We enjoyed the show. The girls were actually singing their favorite song from the show in the parking lot. I looked at Alan and grinned. We jumped right in, and soon half the parking lot joined in for the big finish. We went for a drink later at a small club. I suggested it. I have nothing against dance clubs, but sometimes I actually like to hear myself think and hold a conversation. It was the weekend, and they had a four-piece band, two keyboards, drums, and a guy who switched from guitar to bass as the songs called for it. The music was old light melodies, mostly slow. There were actually a few couples dancing on the small floor. Alan looked at Cindy, and she dragged him out on the floor. One was all I got out before I was on the floor with a hot woman wrapped around me. It was slow, soft, and comfortable instead of arousing. Thank you, she whispered. For what? I asked in surprise. For showing me good guys still exist. Cindy told me to behave, so I did. I know you didn't want to come, but I'm glad you decided to. Me too, I said, realizing I was in it. Whether you know it or not, you're a heck of a woman. Becky, tone the flirting down a notch or two. Invest in someone worthwhile and I'm sure you'll be very happy. I'm not criticizing you, just making an observation based on watching you for the last few years. She actually smiled. Thanks. I think you really think I'm a nice woman. My turn to smile. When you want to be. Either way, you've got the best bum I've ever seen. Ever notice when we're around each other, I'm always a step or two behind you. She flushed, then punched me on the arm. Again, thanks. I think the song ended, and we walked back, talking and smiling. Cindy was sitting there amazed. What were you two talking about? How Jace says I'm a good woman most of the time, and what a great bum I have. Alan choked on his drink, and Cindy laughed. I looked at him. What? Don't tell me you've never noticed. Cindy looked at him suspiciously. What about my bum, honey? He was trying to think of something diplomatic to say when I rescued him. You do have a nice bum, Cindy, but it's not even close to hers. If it's any consolation, you've got a killer rack. Both women looked at me like I was crazy for talking to them like this. 
Alan started laughing. Stop, Jace. Quit while you're ahead. Honey, you do have a nice bum, and you've got Becky B all to heck in that department. But it's you I love, and that's all that counts to me. Nice save, Alan, I thought, remembering now what a good salesman he was. I got a really good kiss, and she made me promise to call her soon. I didn't call for two weeks. That Saturday, I got a pretty sharp call from Cindy. You jerk. She called me that a lot. I hoped it was a term of endearment. She was starting to think there were good guys in the world. And then you don't call. Her feelings are hurt pretty bad. Cindy, I said calmly when she finally wound down. What's Alan been doing for the last two weeks? You know darn well what he's been doing. You've been keeping him at the office all those ungodly hours, getting the Jameson account done. Exactly, I said softly. And what was I doing all this time? Guilting Alan because you're practically living at the office. What's that? Oh, yeah. Oh, suddenly she was apologizing. I'm sorry, Jace. I didn't think. I should have called. Well, call and tell her now. Tell her if she's interested. I'll call next Thursday. I will, I will. I wasn't thinking. I thought later many times about my next statement and how true it turned out to be. Relax, Cindy. She's your friend, of course. You want to protect her and help her be happy. I understand. Gotta go. She was still talking when I hung up. I did call Thursday, and she chattered happily. We made a date. She wanted to go to a movie and then back to what she called our club. I threw in dinner. We had a really great time. The movie was awful, one of those vapid tearjerkers some jerk was making a fortune writing, but the dinner and the dancing were great. By the time we left the bar, she was firmly under my arm. I surprised her by not coming in when I dropped her off. She looked disappointed until I explained why. I'd love to, honey, but Alan and I are working tomorrow. We're almost over the hump with this account, and another recording will make us pretty secure so we're putting all we have into it. I think calling her honey did the trick. I got a really strong kiss, followed by another. I finally had to break it off. Darn, you know how hard it's going to be working tomorrow thinking about these kisses. If I blow this account, I'm making you support me. She giggled prettily. You'll do fine. If you think those were great, wait till I bring out the almost engaged game. That wasn't the almost married game. More giggling. No, that was I really like you a lot. First a kiss, then keep up what you're doing, and you'll get the almost engaged game soon. Now go conquer the business world. Call me soon. She and Cindy surprised us by showing up the next day, bringing a home-cooked meal. You have to eat right, she said, sailing by me. They set the conference table, and we enjoy a feast fit for a king. Afterward, they cleaned up and packed away everything. I found her on the conference table, testing its durability. What are you doing? I asked. Stress testing the table, she replied. I don't want it to break when we use it. Cindy laughed and enjoined her. Yeah, it'll hold us. Bye, honey. Becky got up. Yeah, bye, honey. See you this weekend. We're going to the lake to grill and swim. You guys need some sun. As an ad guy, I know one of the most important rules is to always present your products in the best light while minimizing any weak points. The girls had both bought new swimsuits. Becky wore a modest top, but her bottoms were a bit revealing. Cindy had a modest bottom, but her top was quite minimal. I still don't know why we weren't asked to leave the state park. Perhaps the fact that the lifeguards and manager on duty were all male had something to do with it. Alan and I almost burned the stakes because we couldn't keep our eyes off the girls. Eventually, they put on cover-ups. We ate, played in the water, and got into a volleyball game, us against four guys. Every time they scored, Becky would bend over to pick up the ball or Cindy would jump up and down. We won the game despite not being very skilled. Just before it got dark, they dragged us into the water, not being very skilled. Just before it got dark, they dragged us into the water, snuggling into us. 
We thought we were kissing when she pulled back and dove under. She popped back up grinning. Cindy did the same. Sorry, she said. We were getting too hot. I looked around at Cindy and Alan. Cindy was completely naked, and I noticed that she occasionally bounced. I couldn't see her hands either. Honey, will you get my cover? Aren't you going to put yours on? She put her fingers to my lips and said, No, I intend to stain your upholstery on the way back. Want to complain? Not in the least. Looks like I need to get Cindy's cover too. Not in the least. Looks like I need to get Cindy's cover too. That's her top, isn't it? I'll pass the safety line. Cindy squeaked when she saw it. Becky teased her, telling her she had to come get her cover, while Alan just grinned. Finally, she tossed it to her. Hers was a lot lighter than Becky's, and it was like a wet t-shirt night watching her come out of the water. I heard a gasp and looked around. Three teen boys carrying their gear out were standing there like deer caught in headlights. Cindy grinned and stretched, asking Alan for a towel. Not to be outdone, Becky bent over to pick one up and gave it to her. Good night, boys. Maybe we'll see you next week, they said as they walked to the car. We followed along, admiring the view and laughing. That night will be etched in my memory for the rest of my life. Even now, as hurt and heartbroken as I am, I still remember it. We nearly broke the bed. We were constantly together. They'd meet us for lunch once or twice a week. One would bring it while the other went out. We discovered that the conference table was really sturdy, but the couch not so much. We had to replace it after Alan and Cindy had lunch in one day. We were heading towards moving in when we hit a bump in the road. I always felt it was a warning I should have heeded. We got the other account we wanted so badly. It meant enormous hours until we could afford to hire someone. I usually worked more hours than Alan so we could spend time with Cindy. Becky and I hadn't been out in three weeks. She was a beautiful woman and used to getting a lot of attention, so it didn't sit well with her. She was witchy the last two phone calls despite my apologies. I looked up one Saturday at five thinking I would call her to spend some quality time, but she wasn't home. I called Cindy and she said she thought Becky was out with her friends from work. After venting her frustration at me for not paying more attention, I wasn't in the mood. All right, if that's the way you feel, tell Alan that starting next week, he works every hour I do. Sound good. She was trying to backpedal when I hung up. Forty minutes later, Becky called. Where are you? She asked. I couldn't get hold of you, so I went back to work. Enjoy your night out. I'll call you tomorrow. She was still trying to talk when I hung up. Cindy had killed my mood, and I wanted to be alone. I had started back to work when I decided to eat something. There was a little mom-and-pop operation down the street from the office that had killer hot dogs, so I stopped and ate two, piled so high with toppings they were dripping everywhere, with a large order of handmade onion rings. After all, I wouldn't be kissing anyone tonight, would I? I still grabbed a couple of breath mints on the way out. I started home when I remembered a club Cindy had mentioned. It was sort of like the one we liked except it leaned towards jazz. She had read about it in the entertainment section and thought it might be a change of pace. Maybe they'd be there. Either way, I decided to check it out. It was a nice place, muted lighting, dark wood, a pub-style kitchen, and a nice bar. They had a three-piece band, drums, piano, and stand-up bass. They were pretty good, even though I wasn't a big fan of jazz. I remember thinking Becky would like it when I heard her laugh. It made my day. This had been where she had gone with her girlfriends. The sneaky little devil was doing what I was doing. I started into the lounge area when she walked into view, arm in arm with some guy I'd never seen, heading towards the dance floor. It didn't concern me. We were both often asked to dance by others. We did, but not often. I looked around the floor and didn't see any single girls. Ha! Huh. I decided to hang back and see what was going on. I took a small table off to the side and watched. There was no one else at the table. They danced three more times, the last with his hand firmly on her back. The kiss at the end, 
and the one at the table sealed it. I hadn't asked her to be exclusive, but I expected her to be more upfront if she was dating others. I can't deny it hurt a lot. I wrote it off as a life lesson and started to leave when I remembered the remark about being out with the girls. I got the waitress to take them a round of drinks and gave her a $20 tip. She had the radar of a good cocktail waitress or bartender. There's not going to be any trouble, is there? She asked. I assured her there wouldn't be, saying I was leaving. They were friends of mine, and I felt foolish for not noticing before. The drink was an apology because I had to leave and hadn't talked to them. She bought it, kind of. I waited a minute and dialed her number. The band was on break, and I heard it ring from where she was sitting. She looked at it, said something to her companion, and took the call. Hi. Honey. Change your mind. She sounded so sincere. No, I'm beat. It's bed for me. Say hi to the girls for me. Where are you? It sounds awfully quiet. The band's on break, and the girls had to go to the restroom. I'm guarding the drinks. The waitress was approaching with their drinks. They looked over at me, and I stepped out of the shadows. The fedora is nice, isn't it? Tell your girlfriend here not to go into the ladies' room dressed like that. They might not understand. Her mouth opened and closed a couple of times before she could recover. By then, I was already out the door. I sat in a dark parking lot across the street and watched as she ran out the door, looking around wildly. Her date came out and said something, but she shook him off. The phone started ringing, and I cut it off. I didn't feel like talking. Her date argued some more, and she kept shaking her head. Finally, he gave up in disgust and went back inside. I wondered what she was waiting for. Fifteen minutes later, Cindy roared up in her SUV. She climbed in and started towards my apartment. I went the other way, not in the mood for a bunch of drama. I found a motel, paid cash, and crashed for ten straight hours. There was no one in my parking lot when I got home. So I showered, changed, and headed back out. I went by the office, but Alan and Cindy were there. I figured Becky was lurking somewhere, so I drove away. Going four hours to the mountains, I called and left a message at their house, telling them I needed a break and would be back Tuesday. I slept, walked around in the sunshine, and enjoyed it immensely. I ate what I wanted when I wanted. I even stopped at a tourist trap and bought them awesome gifts. Tuesday morning, I was in the office bright and early. I had parked the car out of sight, and Alan nearly jumped out of his skin when he walked in. He grabbed his phone immediately. Use that, and I'm gone for the rest of the week. Understand? He nodded, watching me warily. Good. Let's get to work. I feel great. That little break made a world of difference. I've come up with some good ideas. Tell me what you think. So, until lunchtime, we worked away. He was excited about the new ideas. At lunch I told him I'd see him in an hour and left. Usually, I ate a sandwich at my desk and kept working. He had been back twenty minutes before me. Cindy arrived twenty minutes later. She drew in a big breath, and I held up my hand. I'll talk first, if you don't mind. Becky doesn't owe me a thing except honesty. We hadn't talked about being exclusive. I would have hated it, but I would have understood if she told me she wanted to see others. But she didn't, and then she lied about who she was with and where she was. That tells me a lot. She started to talk, and I held my hand up again. Not done yet. Tell her not to bother me. I'll call her sometime this week. One more thing. Did you know she was on a date, and then lied to me about it? If I think you did, it would affect our friendship greatly. If I can't trust you, you're not my friend. Understand? She paled a little, and Alan looked uncomfortable. Then she lied. I didn't know, or I would have stopped her. I'm mad at her too, Jace. I thought she was finally growing up. I'm as disappointed as you are. I chewed her out, and she asked, What do you mean? When did you chew her out? That night she called me from the club. A crying mess. We spent half the night looking and waiting for you. We finally went to my house and crashed for a few hours. 
You had come and gone while we were asleep. Can I at least call her and tell her you're back? And we'll talk to her. I sighed mentally. Maybe she was telling me the truth after all. Yes, by all means, call her now. If you want to keep that house and the tank you drive, you need to let us go back to work. At six on the dot, I told Alan I was leaving for the day. You're kidding, right? There's lots to do yet. And it'll all be here tomorrow when we come back. No more killing myself, at least for a while, I said, leaving him with his mouth hanging open. The next day, I placed an ad for an associate. Alan was upset because it ate into the profits. Fine, I said. I'll pull the ad, but if we do, from now on, we're hourly. The salary goes out the window. He didn't like that because he knew I easily worked at least a third more than he did, so he kept quiet. I hired a woman straight out of school. She was really talented, but had no real-world experience. I ended up spending a lot of time with her at first, but she developed nicely. Our business actually increased because we could handle more. Between Ida and me, we kept the ideas rolling while Alan handled the contacts and sales. I called Becky like I promised. She didn't know what to say. I'm sorry, she finally said. For what? I asked. For lying to you. For going out behind your back. I was climbing the walls and just wanted to get out. I wasn't going to be unfaithful. I just needed a companion. I shocked her. I understand, and you hadn't made me any promises, but I expected honesty, and you lied like crazy. Tell me how I could trust you enough now to return to where we were or go forward. You know I was wanting more. I thought you did too. Oh well, a leopard in its spots, and all that. That offhand comment actually sent me into a rage. Darn you. You always had it in the back of your head that I couldn't measure up, didn't you? I bet you threw your arm out of socket patting yourself on the back and saying, I told you so. I was falling in love, and for the first time in my life, I was scared and lonely. Feelings I never had to handle. I screwed up. I'm sorry. I said it gently, just above a whisper. I'm sorry too, she said, and I was already in love with you. I hung up to her voice pleading with me to stay on the line. I didn't talk to her for two weeks. When I did, I didn't expect what was said. Would you like to go to a club Saturday? Maybe eat at that new Indian restaurant before? I was shocked by the anger in her voice. Decided to forgive the poor sinner. Ha! Huh. My penance over. I hung up gently. I didn't need this. Cindy called me. What did you say to her? Ask her out. Silence. I thought maybe she'd hung up. Oh, what did she say? She didn't say yes, and that's all that matters. Good night, Cindy. Two days later, Cindy called me again. I'm with Becky. If I give her the phone, will you talk to her? Yes, if she'll talk and not rant. Make her understand it's getting easier and easier not to talk to her. If she wants to say something... Do it without drama or hysterics. Tell her, then hand her the phone. I heard a couple of minutes of whispering. Jace, hi. Becky. Jace, I'm really sorry for everything. I'd like to start over, like new. I want you to see me as a new person, not someone you used to know. Ellen wants to grill Sunday. Will you come over to visit or grill? She gave a little laugh. Ellen would burn concrete if you put it on the grill. Both. I'd like to actually eat. Make your potato salad, and it's a date. I will. Thank you, Jace. It took five months to regain a sense of intimacy. I dated others, which upset her no end. I told her up front if I couldn't go out with her and why. She bit her lips raw, holding back. When we decided to get intimate, we had the big talk. If we're intimate, it's just us. No one else. Do you understand? Even if you just go out with old friends, if I find out about it from someone besides you, we're over. There won't be any rising from the ashes this time, and I don't intend to be your jailer. I won't be checking up on you. You're on your own. Mess up. And it's all you. She agreed too quickly for my taste. 
I want you to really think about this, Beck. I'm talking long-term commitment here. Don't give me your answer yet. I need to get tested before we do anything. I don't want to bring anything extra with me. For the first time, she understood I had been with others. I could see the tears, but she fought them back. All right, honey. I haven't been with anyone since you, but I'll do it too, and I already know the answer. A week later, we exchanged clean bills of health and apartment keys. Being close with Beck was always exciting, but the welcome back closeness nearly killed me. I actually fell asleep at work twice. Alan said something to Cindy, and she told Becky to let me rest occasionally, so she could keep her house. She agreed reluctantly. I still worked long hours, but not like before. The experience had taught me to prioritize. We had been living together for eight months when I called her at her job. Can you get off this afternoon? I wouldn't ask, but it's really important. She agreed instantly, so I picked her up, handing her a drive through bag. Sorry, babe, this will have to hold you until dinner. I refused to tell her what it was about. We drove to a nice neighborhood and pulled into a driveway. There was a for sale sign out front and a realtor waiting. Is this your wife? She asked politely. Maybe, I said. I'll know by the end of the day. Becky looked at me like I was crazy. Well, let's have a look, shall we, dear? Really, men have no clue what's really important in a house, don't you agree? Oh, they understand structure, brick and wood, but they don't have a feel for comfort or possibilities. She kept up her patter as she showed Becky the house. Three bedrooms, a nice big lot, a small patio. Excuse me for just a moment while we confer, will you? She said to the realtor before grabbing me into the living room. Look, honey, a fireplace. She wasn't going to be distracted. She backed me against the mantel. What the heck is going on here? Really, Beck? Isn't it obvious? We're house hunting. I don't want to start married life in an apartment. Besides, when we have kids, we're going to need the space. I don't think she heard much past married life before she launched into my arms. I scraped the back of my head on the stone mantel and didn't care at all. Then she cried, then giggled, and then got serious. Where's my ring? I haven't got it yet. I thought we'd pick it out together. The realtor came looking for us and heard the last part. She laughed. What did I tell you, dear? Clueless. I swear, if we didn't guide them, the species would disappear. Are you up to looking at a few more houses? Up for it. Becky nearly dragged us both out. I got to sit in the back while they talked location, school districts, and shopping access. I stopped listening after five minutes. We looked at four more houses before we went back to our car. She wanted to look at that one once more. When we got to the living room, she looked at the mantel, smiled, and said, This one. It took a week to do the paperwork. Our business was booming. We had hired another associate, and Alan was training a new salesman. With the hefty down payment I was able to make, we were able to move in less than a month. Of course, we didn't bring any of our old furniture. I let her choose until she got to the patio. This is mine, I said defiantly. She laughed and agreed. I spent a little money and installed an outdoor kitchen and living area, even had a clay oven built. I loved it. We ended up cooking outside ten months out of the year on a regular basis and sporadically the other two. Cindy was a little jealous, and before we knew it, we had new neighbors a block over. It made it easier to share rides to work. I swear they wore a path in the sidewalk going back and forth. Things went great for three years. Cindy couldn't have children, so they went through the long, frustrating process of adoption. The patients paid off when they got a set of twin girls, 18 months old. We held a little party to celebrate that turned into a tear fest for the girls, while we learned what it was like to watch two active toddlers. Your life is over, I laughingly told Alan. No, it's not, he said through obvious tears. It's just beginning. I was really quiet as we walked home, and so was Becky. I stopped at the end of our driveway. In four months, that way I won't have to carry him or her through the heat of the summer. The neighbors must have thought we were crazy 
on our knees in the driveway, hugging and crying. Right after that conversation, the economy started tanking. Six months later, Becky's company suddenly declared bankruptcy. She didn't get severance pay. She didn't get her vacation pay. Nothing. She was pretty distraught. Calm down, honey. A lot of people are going under, including a few of our biggest competitors. We're getting a lot of interest from their old clients. I may have to work a little harder, but we'll be fine. And as good as you are at your job, someone will snap you up. The economy got worse, and she never found another job in her field. No one wanted to pay her what she was worth despite her experience, when they could get an MBA straight out of school for half as much. She fretted. She brooded. She and Cindy joined a gym close enough they could walk to, pushing the kids in strollers. This kept her going for a few months. Never really out of shape. She was like a rock. After a couple of months, she started volunteering for some big causes, hoping she could network a job out of it. I didn't like it because she would be gone almost every other weekend to some charity event or another, but I kept quiet, thinking it was doing her some good. One Friday, she came in at 2 a.m., waking me from a dead sleep with a first-class, I'm so excited job. I got a job. I'm the new assistant event coordinator for the Sloan Group. Tonight was my trout, and they liked what they saw. They represent four major charities. It's not as much as I was making, but close enough to start. She was on an emotional high, and I cuddled her, making the right noises. It had been almost a year, and she still wasn't pregnant. We went to the doctor. He looked over the tests he'd ordered. You're both fine. Everything is in good working order. There's no reason why you won't be pregnant soon. My guess is it's the stress she's been under because of the economy. Animal birth rates go down if the food supply is threatened or if there is an unusually large number of predators in their range. It's the same with women. Birth rates are low in stressful environments, like war zones, for instance. Go home. Practice a lot. It'll happen, the doctor said. But it didn't happen. She came to me the next day during lunch. Honey, I need you to do something for me. Sure, baby, what do you need? She fidgeted for a bit. I want you to let me go back on birth control for another year. Let me get comfortable in my new job and build up enough time so I won't lose it over pregnancy. Just a year, honey, I promise. I was actually a little relieved. The economy was still going downhill and I didn't see an upswing for quite a while. So I agreed. We were doing a lot more work, picking up the slack from failed companies. It was tougher than ever, if we couldn't do it for what they wanted to pay. There was another ad agency just down the street desperate for business. Part of her job was attending the events to make sure they went smoothly. I went when I could, but more and more, she went along. She told me not to worry since she was working anyway. As the husband of one of the key players and a business owner, I was expected to contribute to as many of the charities as they represented as possible. We picked out the two we thought most worthwhile and committed to them. We even sent someone occasionally to represent the company at the events. Alan and Cindy went a few times, but he was as overworked as I was, so he backed off. The economy was finally starting to turn around. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Becky had been at her job for a year and had gotten a small promotion and raise. We started talking about a family again. I talked Ida and her husband into representing the company at some of the events. It kept our name in focus and allowed Alan and me to work more. Ida had developed nicely to the point that she was being courted by competitors. We had a long talk about it. I told her if she got a truly good offer, I wouldn't hold it against her if she took it. She assured me that none had made an attractive enough offer to even consider moving yet. I noticed she seemed a little down and seemed to be avoiding me unless it was absolutely necessary. I figured she had finally gotten that good offer. I called her in for a little chat. You haven't been yourself lately, Ida. If I'd noticed, so has everyone else. Something you want to talk about. Ida was an attractive woman. Tall, striking, usually smiling. If you got past her looks, you discovered she had a steel trap for a mind. She looked down, smoothing her dress, one of her stress signs. 
I thought a lot about what I'm about to tell you. My husband has been pushing me to talk to you. So here it is. It might not matter. You might already know. If not, please don't be angry with us. I figured this was it. She was giving me notice. She pulled out her tablet, fiddled with it for a bit, and handed it to me. It was a series of photographs of Becky and a man I didn't recognize. There were shots of them laughing, holding hands, kissing, one of them dancing with his hands on her rear. He had her dress eased up until the bottoms of her cheeks were showing. One was in a semi-dark room with a fierce lip lock. These were taken over the last three events we've been to. I don't think she's realized who I am or that I work for you. The last time she knew I was there, she spoke to me and was extremely professional. Maybe you knew, but I didn't want to be the one to bring it to your attention if you didn't. Please don't fire me. I was in shock. This had to be some kind of gag. I'd go home, and Becky would laugh. All our friends would jump out, and she'd say, gotcha, and explain it all away. But I knew, I knew that it was exactly as it looked. I sat for a minute before telling a nervous Ida that her job was quite safe and asked if she would transfer the images to my computer and burn me a hard copy. She stood. You didn't know, did you? I'm so sorry. If you need anything, ask. She came around and hugged me, the first physical contact we had in all the time we worked together. Again, I'm sorry. I am too, I said. Please don't say anything about this. She promised and fled the office, scared of the look on my face. Despite being an idea man, I was stumped. I did what I always did when approaching any problem. I did research. All I had now were pictures from an amateur. I wanted hard evidence. His name was Johnny Walker, and he hated scotch. I should have been named Jim or Jack, he said. I'm a bourbon man through and through. He came highly recommended to me as one of the best in his business, so I hired him. It only took two weeks to get me everything I wanted. He met me at a bar owned by one of his friends. There were rooms for private parties, and we used one of those. I didn't want to be seen going into his office or him coming into mine. He agreed totally. I'd even bought a burner phone I kept locked in my desk to use for communication with him. I know it sounds paranoid. But if it was nothing, I didn't want Becky getting wind of the fact that I had her investigated. It would not lead to good things. It's all here, he said, giving me a small briefcase. Pictures, video, interviews with friends and co-workers. Some of them didn't even know she was married. Apparently, she doesn't wear her rings at work. They weren't particularly careful. I handed him a check and picked up the case. He stopped me. You're not going to do anything stupid, are you? Scorched earth violence. You've been awfully calm about this, and in my business, calm is kind of scary. It's not worth going to jail for. Cut your losses and move on if you can't forgive her. I'm not going to hurt her or him, physically, at least. They both went into it with their eyes open. Surely they considered all that could happen if they got caught. I paused, thinking. I'm not going to hide money, make ridiculous demands, or play games. I'm not going to fight to keep her. I should never have to be in the position to have to fight for her. And by her actions, there's nothing to fight for. She broke the marriage of her own free will. I'm just going to walk away. Does that make me a wimp? No, it doesn't. It makes you a man of good judgment, someone calm and logical under pressure, a rarity in these situations and they probably didn't consider the consequences at all. If you do decide to get a lawyer, I suggest. I shook my head. I thought I'd wait for the report. He wrote something on a notepad and handed it to me. I work a lot with these three. They're all good. The first is a shark. He isn't happy until blood is spilled. The second is the guy you want if you want to stop a divorce. Not a good choice in your situation. The third guy is your man. He doesn't like drama and likes to keep things as clean and calm as possible while doing his best for your interests. If you don't have anyone lined up, give him a call. Mention me, and you'll get a discount. He walked to the door, turning back. If I were you, I wouldn't watch the DVD or look at the pictures. 
It won't help your case and will burn memories into you that will take years to erase. Same with the report. You already know all you need to know. However, read the contents of the red envelope. There's some pretty interesting information about your friends and their knowledge of her affair. As per your instructions, we won't turn the phone tap off for another two weeks. Again, I urge you not to listen to them. Call if you need anything else. I took the case to my office, extracted the red envelope, and locked the case in the bottom of my file cabinet. I took his advice for now. I called the third man on the list and set up a consultation. Paul Whitfield ran a small three-partner office. The offices were in an old building that still had ornate moldings, high ceilings, and dangling fans. He saw me looking and grinned. We own the building. I insisted we keep the fans. They give the place character. I liked him instantly. He warmed up during the meeting. And when we were done, I had a divorce lawyer I felt I could trust. He approved of the amicable split and said he could do better on the settlement. This wasn't a no-fault state, but it should make it easier for everyone if she didn't fight. Think she will. I have learned recently that I have no idea what she is thinking or doing. When can we file? Thursday or Friday, whichever you think best. I thought about it. Can I have it done on a Saturday evening? He looked at me. This isn't going to stray into getting stupid territory, is it? I grinned for the first time. Probably. Hold off until Monday. Serve her then. She should be home by seven, not at her office. No, let her keep a little dignity. Besides, if she's fired, wouldn't I have to support her? Smart man. He grinned and shook my hand before going back into lawyer mode. Call me if you think of anything you forgot to tell or ask me. Thank you for your business, even if it's stad business. I'll call right before she gets served if you want. I got my ducks in a row. I looked around and found a nice two-bedroom house in the next town over. I thought about an apartment or condo but preferred houses. It would mean a 35-minute commute, but it was a quiet neighborhood, and I didn't think she'd look for me this far out. I had read the red folder. It made me very, very angry to know how many people I knew were aware of or helped cover for her affair. Their time would come, especially four of them. I played nice at work and kept up the farce at home for the rest of the week. She was feeling affectionate Thursday, letting me warm her up for the weekend. I guess by now she was just nothing to me. I didn't necessarily cuddle her, but it wasn't exactly loving either. She got off. I got off. Then I got off her. You seemed a little distracted tonight, honey. Do I not do it for you anymore? She acted playful, but I sensed an undertone of fear in her words. You've always done it for me, Beck. I'm just tired and stressed. Let's get some sleep. I tried, but I just couldn't make myself cuddle, so I turned over and faked sleep. She snuggled to me, spooning. Love you, baby. I didn't answer, still pretending to be asleep. I think she could tell I was faking, but she didn't say anything. In the end, I just couldn't stand it, straying right into what Paul called stupid territory. I waited until almost an hour after the event was in progress before walking through the doors. I stood on the fringe of the crowd, watching. They held hands and snatched a little kiss now and then. The band started up and I watched them sway across the floor. He was a better dancer than I'd ever be. Other than that, I didn't see it. He wasn't as tall as me or as toned, no accounting for taste or lack thereof, as my great-aunt was fond of saying. I was almost to them when I stopped dead. Cindy appeared right in front of them. They hugged, and they all laughed. I wondered if Alan knew she was here. I was like Moses parting the Red Sea. One look at my face, and people got out of the way. Becky must have noticed how the crowd was moving back. She turned, still holding his hand, and looked dead into my eyes. She froze for a few seconds before trying to form words and let go of his hand. He grinned, the happy grin of a guy whose life is good, and held out his hand. Friend of yours, Han, he said, finally letting go and holding out his hand. No, I snarled. Husband. He paled and took two steps back. 
I looked at Beck. Aren't you going to introduce us? Jace, honey, it's not what it looks like. Give it up. It's exactly what it looks like. My wife keeping company with another man. How's that for putting it politely? I could have said, the person who's screwing the guy she's hanging the horns on me with, the scum-sucking bottom feeder who has no problem messing around with a married woman. I was getting louder, and I drew myself in, breathing deeply. Her honey was trying to disappear into the crowd. Quite a few were listening. I called out to him, drawing even more attention. Where do you think you're going? You've got the courage to be with her, but not stand by her when it hits the fan. Doesn't say much for you, does it? But don't worry. She's yours now. I've got no more use for her. Becky was pulling my arm, begging me to calm down, and that we'd find a place to talk. I removed her hand a little forcefully. I know, Beck, I know. Don't try to spin it. Don't insult me by trying to explain it. We're through. I completely understand. I left you a little something on the dining room table. It should bring back fond memories for you. I looked at Cindy, standing beside her and looking completely terrified. And you, don't you ever speak to me again, not in this lifetime. If we're in the same room, it would be better if you stay as far away from me as possible or leave right away. No, wait. I do want to hear one thing. Did Alan know? She hung her head. That told me all I needed to know. Then tell him we're through. His partners, he can buy me out, or I'll put my half up for sale. It hit the fan big time. She called Alan, called Cindy, called over and over. I didn't answer. I erased the messages. I kept my car in my little garage with the door down. I was within walking distance to a grocery store and a bar. I didn't like the bar, but the store was fine. I shocked the heck out of Alan by showing up at the office Monday. He started to talk, but I shut him down. I know you knew. Cindy is good. She's told me, being the true loyal friend she is. I'll never forgive Cindy for helping her, and before you say it, she was helping her at the very least by keeping her secret. So tell your wife it would be in her best interest to stay away from the office and me. If she insists on being here, I won't. I'll let the business go down the drain and walk away. Alan, it would be very easy. This includes Becky, her companion, or any other of our so-called friends. Leave it alone. I had already called the police about restraining orders. They told me to talk to my lawyer. By nine, Becky and Cindy were pounding on my office door. I called Alan. If you want to stay in business, make them leave now, or I'll be the one leaving, and I won't come back. I could hear a lot of the argument through the door. Becky was refusing to leave, and Cindy was supporting her. Alan was trying to make them understand. Please, girls, I'm begging here. This is his place of business as well as mine, and he has the right to conduct it as he sees fit. If you push it, he'll have grounds for a restraining order. And that would be bad. He's so upset he told me he's going to sell his half of the business. If I don't buy it, he'll go to someone else. We can't afford that. Cindy, not now. We've just gotten to the edge of being really successful. He's the idea man. The brains behind the business. I just sell whatever he comes up with. It would ruin us. Cindy, think about the kids. I heard more mumbling than silence. He called. They've left. You can come out of the office now. I don't think so. As long as I'm in here, I'm in an annoyance-free zone. Go back to work. Try to figure out what you're going to do, and ask Ida to come in, please. He was starting to bathe again when I hung up. It's been an interesting few days. Care to hear about it? She said as she sat down. Curiosity got the better of me. So I nodded. I was there. You had forgotten, hadn't you? I nearly flipped when I saw you. Mac and her husband and I were trying to intercept you, but you were too quick. Mac said he saw anger on your face. I know you managed to scare the heck out of quite a few people after you gave your little speech and left. It was chaos for a while. Becky did try to follow you, but Cindy and the guy held her back. I was close by then and I heard Cindy tell her to give you a little time to cool down first. She was crying, saying if she didn't get to you, 
Then she'd never get another chance. But by the time she broke loose, you were gone. Quite a few of the patrons left after the scene. I have a feeling donations that night were a little shy of expectations. She stopped looking at me. Do you know his name? Yes, and his age, his residence, what kind of car he drives, his past, and everything else a really good P.I. could come up with. She shuddered a little. You're not going to do anything cruel, are you? Yes, I said, making her blanch. I'm going to ignore him. Every time he walks around a blind corner or hears a loud noise behind him, he'll expect it's me. He'll be a nervous wreck for a while. Eventually, he'll figure out I have absolutely no interest in him, and that will be the biggest insult I could give him. What about your wife? They had to almost carry her out of the place. I think she's beginning to realize how bad it's going to be. I don't have a wife, I said, stone-faced. Then I grinned, ease your mind. But if anything ever happens and you find yourself single, I'd be like a politician at a pork barrel. White boys aren't all bad. She smiled. I don't cross the color lines, but if anything ever happens for you, I'd make an exception. We stood, and she hugged me. It felt great. She rubbed those nice, comforting hands across my chest. I couldn't help it. I smiled. She grinned back. We worked the rest of the afternoon. When I came out, there were two envelopes on my bike seat, one from Cindy and one from Beck. I knew Alan was watching as I dropped them on the ground and left. I hadn't gone a block when I saw a familiar SUV behind me. I laughed into my helmet. Let the chase begin. I was on my Yamaha Roadster 102, a nod to success. It was two years old. I'd gotten a really good deal on it. Beck loved it and we spent many afternoons just tooling around, exploring, keeping close. I suddenly made a right turn on red. There were two cars behind me, stuck. I whipped into a parking lot three blocks down, waited until I saw them zip by, and went back the way I'd come. They were probably still driving around in circles when I pulled into my garage. I carried the burner phone I'd gotten with me and left my regular phone locked in my desk drawer. I still used it for business. I'd screen and delete everything but my customers and lawyer. Beck finally sent a registered letter, which I signed for, then sent back to her unopened. My lawyer did all my talking. She's a firecracker, he said, and she sure knows a lot of colorful words. She was living in the house, and I was making half the payment. I directed Paul to tell her it would stop six months after we divorced, by which time I hoped to sell it or she could buy me out. I knew that would never happen. She simply couldn't afford it. She refused to get a lawyer. Paul shrugged. She isn't required to, but you can bet at the first hearing. The judge will strongly suggest she get counsel. That will be the first attempt to drag it out as long as she can. She's not going to let go. I saw it in her eyes. I'm all right with racking up the billable hours. But at some point, you need to talk to her or just say the heck with it and withdraw the petition. He saw the look on my face and held up his hands. I didn't say go back to her. Just do what you're doing now and ignore her. It may take a while. But eventually, she'll get tired and agree to the divorce. Let's give it until the actual hearing. Maybe she'll realize she's wasting her time and be reasonable. You really think so? I felt a faint ray of hope. Nope, he said, grinning as he walked me out. She got her friends to intercede for her. Bad idea. Really, really bad idea. Word got out about my reactions, and most of them understood it was a forbidden subject. Then her mom took up the banner. I'd always liked her, and I told her if she needed anything, help in any way, I'd be insulted if she didn't call me. But if she said her daughter's name one more time... I would never speak to her again. My mom became involved. I tried to make her see things as I did. It didn't even slow her down. I left and didn't return for three months. She stared right back into trying to get me to be reasonable. I left, and she called me two weeks later, crying, and promised to never bring her up again. I think she got it now. She was going with the sad. I'll suffer in silence. But you know I'm right, look. It wasn't working for her. 
She did say she thought I needed to see someone. The anger is changing you, honey. Not for the best. You need to get your balance back for your own well-being. I thought about that for a while. I tried to compartmentalize, keep it separate from the rest of my life, but never could get it to work. It was the worst when I saw Cindy. She still came occasionally by the office. She knew better than to say anything. She could see in my eyes what I thought of her. She and Alan were not doing well. They were stressed, trying to figure out a way to save the business. Alan tried to talk about it once. I actually listened, calm enough now to be curious as to what they could possibly say that would justify their behavior. Please, Jace, I'm begging you here. If you pull out, we both know I'll be out of business in six months. I've worked as hard as you to make this a success. I'll lose everything. The house, the cars. I have children, remember. I need to provide them with the best quality of life possible. Instead of calming me, it just made me angrier. Really? You're using the kids as a bargaining chip. Tell me something. Did you even remotely consider how I might react when my best friends in the whole world were helping the love of my life betray me? You might have considered the ramifications before you got involved. Maybe if you remembered the last time she did something like this, and my reaction back then. When we weren't married or even seriously committed, you would have spoken up. Were you thinking about the kids while you were lying to me? He flushed and looked really, really angry. God dang it, it's time for you to get over yourself and think about the harm you're doing here. Because your feelings are hurt, she betrayed you. I'm sorry I shouldn't have allowed Cindy and myself to get involved. I was trying to protect you. Do I need to kick your rear to get you to understand? Wrong thing to say. You wanted to protect me. Then why didn't you read Cindy the riot act? Tell Beck she was making a serious mistake. Threatened to tell me unless she stopped. I think you weren't worried about me at all, but more worried about the business. This cash cow has moved her last. Alan, you're good at what you do. You'll find a job pretty easily, especially now that the economy is rebounding. You may not have the quality of life you have now, but you'll survive. Cindy could actually get a job for a while to help. It might give her the shock of reality she needs. And as far as kicking my rear, you don't have any idea how part of me wants you to really try. My mom says I need to release some of my rage. Pounding the daylights out of you might go a long way towards doing that. Now, if you're done, get the heck out of my office. Go work on your resume or something. As I said, Alan is six feet four inches. I just barely made it to six feet, and he outweighed me by sixty pounds. But the thing he didn't have was rage. He grabbed me, spun me around, opening his mouth to say more. I didn't give him a chance, swinging instantly. I gave it everything I had, putting all the pain and rage I had into one punch. It landed right between the eyes. He went down like an imploded building. I stood over him, rubbing my knuckles. I believe we're done here. The door had been open, and Ben, our new salesman, was standing there with his mouth open. I think I'll work from home the rest of the day. Help him up, will you? It was two days before I went back. He'd been treated for a concussion, and he looked like a raccoon with two black eyes. From then on, we communicated by email. The punch scared me. Mom was right. I needed to see someone. Kathy Grimes was one of the best in her field, according to what information I could gather. It was two weeks before she could see me. She was about my age, roughly, and was professional with a warm manner and disarming style. Judging by the pictures on the wall, she was happily married with two preteen children. Nice-looking kids, I said, looking at the pictures. She smiled. Thanks. Do you have any children? No, I sighed. I don't think it'll ever happen for me. Oh, in this business, I've learned to never say never. You're fairly young. There's plenty of time. She gestured to a chair at a table. Her office looked like a living room. In one corner was a table, plain like you'd see in millions of country kitchens. The seats all had cushions for comfort. Good choice, she smiled. I find it's more relaxing in the long run. She put a pitcher of water, a coffee carafe, 
and a plate of cookies on the table before sitting down. Homemade oatmeal raisin from a secret family recipe that you can only get from the top of the oatmeal box, water, or coffee. After she poured the water, she got down to business. First off, tell me exactly why you wanted to see me and what you hope to accomplish by the end of these sessions. I liked it direct and to the point. I'm having a stressful time in my life right now. It's giving me anger management issues. I'd like you to help me focus and get over the anger. I'm tired of the way I am now. Even I don't like me much. Well, that's pretty simple. Now the big questions. What made you so angry? Can it be rectified? Do you want to rectify it or move on? For the next 90 minutes, I talked about my history before and during the courtship, marriage, and beyond. How much I had loved her, how deeply she had hurt me. She listened, made notes, and interjected with a question now and then. By the time I was done, the session was over. Well, you've given me a lot to digest. I'll be reviewing the tapes before the next session. Same time next week. All right. And if you feel the rage build up beyond reason, call me. I'll try and work you in. Would you like me to prescribe something to calm you? Thanks, but no. See you next week. I had been going for a month and was actually feeling better. Better when she asked me if she could make some observations. You're a nice man, Jace, in a not-so-nice situation. You've been terribly hurt. The level of betrayal you feel is enormous. That's why you react so strongly when your wife is mentioned. I see this sort of thing all the time, and I'd never seen a deeper sense of betrayal. It's eating you up, and you don't know why. In my opinion, you still love your wife. She held up her hand before I could speak. That doesn't mean you want to go back to her. The fact that all your friends seem to support or turn a blind eye only compounds the situation. All of them telling you to get over it, forgive her already, didn't help any. It keeps the pain front and center. In the end, you have to ask yourself if you'll be happier with her or without her. I thought about it for a few minutes. It stinks either way. She's betrayed me twice now. If I take her back despite any promises she makes, she'll have it in her head that if she messes up again, I'll just forgive her again. I'm not willing to take that chance. I couldn't go through it again. I paused, and she waited. So I guess we're done. I still love her, but love isn't the issue here. Trust is. I can't ever see a way to trust her again. And that says it all. And all our so-called friends, I can understand a little reticence. It would be a terribly awkward conversation. But the ones who helped her, the ones who gave her alibis, and kept her secret, they're dead to me. Looking back, I realize they were mostly her friends anyway. I think you know by now, I've always been pretty much a loner. I like people, but I don't have the need to surround myself with them all the time. There's a song lyric, being alone doesn't mean I'm lonely. That's me. She was nodding. That's consistent with my understanding. My opinion, if you want it, is to go ahead with the divorce. But, and I can't stress the importance of this, you need to talk to her. As long as you don't, she's going to hold hope that she can get you back. Tell her why that will never happen. If you can make her understand, she may stop fighting the divorce. You've told me how you fought counseling, but you seem to be at the point now of being calm enough to consider it, especially if it gets you the results you want quicker. I can set up a few joint sessions with her if you like, act as a referee. Your choice entirely, but that's my expert opinion. I thought about it for a while. I was tired. It needed to be over. Maybe if I went to counseling with her instead of fighting it, she would finally understand and let us move on. Think she'll come. She nodded. I'm almost positive she'll see it as a chance to finally state her case and get you back. I'm warning you now, though. It could be pretty painful. I told her to set it up. I've been in pain since I found out. I'm pretty sure a little more won't kill me. The sad part was I knew she still really loved me. I knew because I listened in on her phone conversations for the next few weeks before I allowed Johnny to remove the taps. The first days after we split were mostly her calling me. The messages I didn't listen to on my phone, 
I got to hear anyway. Most were tearful entreaties for me to talk to her, to let her explain. After about the first fifty, it was down to one sentence. Please talk to me. Jace, please. The conversations with her friends were pretty interesting, especially Cindy. God, we really screwed up, didn't we? Yes, we did. I don't know what I was thinking, Cindy. Why did I do it? She actually giggled. You did it because it was fun. You're a classic cake eater, honey, thinking you could have them both, and he'd never find out. I never thought he'd find out either. I'm sorry Alan found out, but I knew he'd never tell. He needed Jace too badly. Heck, we all need him. You know he's trying to get out of the partnership, don't you? Say, if we do it in our private lives, wonder what he was up to in the business. We've got to get to him, get him back on board. We've got to fix this. Becky was sobbing quietly. I don't think there's enough making up in the world to fix this one. Cindy, he's really angry. He left me a folder with pictures and interviews. You'd be amazed how quickly some were to throw me under the bus. I can't believe how arrogant we were. Some of her friends were no better. Most talked to her about strategies to get me in the same room with her, right up to and including kidnapping. Most promised to talk to me. Their reports afterward were entertaining. One woman chewed her out pretty badly. I'm done. He almost took our heads off. And the sad thing is, we deserved it. He asked my husband if I was all right with you having an affair and actually helping you cover it and give alibis. What was I doing when he wasn't around? I'm still mad. Jack is really angry. I'm pretty sure you're done. Beck, I know we are. I wouldn't ask any more of us to talk to him. Sorry, honorable. The jerk actually called her three times. She hung up on him the first time, but the next two, right before I turned the taps off, were enlightening. Don't hang up, Becky. We're in serious trouble here. We need to talk. Our jobs are in the balance. You think I give a dang about the job, Greg? The worst thing I ever did in my life was go to work for you. I could hear the irritation in his voice. Come off the high horse, girl. You practically begged for this job. It might have been my idea to fool around, but you didn't hesitate once the subject came up. Speaking of that, wanna get together. He's not coming back, and you know it. The look in his eyes that night scared the heck out of me. We could console each other. He'd never know. She exploded. That's what we thought the first time. Remember how that worked out. And if he's that upset now, what do you think he'd do if he found out? No means no, Greg. Never again. Calm down. It was just a thought. I have to go in front of the board of directors next week. Word of our little escapade has gotten back to them. You'll probably get a call too. We need to decide how to spin this. She actually laughed. Spin this. If they ask, I'm going to tell them the truth. We had an affair. We both share the blame. I will tell them that it's over and that I'll never do it again. If they let me stay, I doubt they will. He'll try one more time. They'll fire me, Becky, whether they do or not. This type of work is all I've ever done. If I get let go and word gets out, I'll probably never work in this business again. She softened a bit. I'm not throwing you under the bus here. It was both our fault. But I have to tell the truth. If I don't and Jace finds out, I really will be done. I'm actually fond of you, Greg, but you're not worth my marriage. Well, she seemed sincere. I called their direct boss and arranged a meeting. He showed up with his lawyer, scared to death I was going to sue them. That kind of publicity in this economy would seriously compromise their fundraising abilities, and I knew they had a very strict moral code, an absolute necessity for their company. They could lose contracts, and it would be very hard to attract new charities. Up until now, they'd had a really good record. I played the tape for them. Before you talk, I need to tell you this tape was legally obtained. If push comes to shove, I'll make it a public record in my divorce. I let them sweat before I gave them my proposal. I'll forego legal recourse for certain considerations. First, my wife is never to know of this meeting. Second, reprimand her 
demote her, do whatever you want except fire her. I need her to have a job during the divorce. Do what you want with Greg. But in my opinion, this doesn't seem like the first time to me. What if it had been a major donor or the wife or daughter of one? In my opinion, he's a disaster waiting to happen. Agreed. Of course, we can't write this up, but I've taped this session here. I pulled out the recorder and gave them the tape. I neglected to mention the other recorder was still going. Now if I make trouble for you, you can play the tape. And one more thing, you have a volunteer, Cindy Waller. She helped my wife conduct her affair and covered for her. It might be good if she wasn't associated with you any longer. They looked like bobbleheads, shaking up and down in agreement. Cindy did get demoted and put on probation, but kept her job. Cindy was mad when they told her it might be best if she volunteered for another organization, but she understood. I feel like Jace was behind it, she whined to Becky. What if he was? So what? I bet Alan would agree if you would admit it. Judged by the company you keep, Cindy, and right now I'm toxic. They allowed Greg to resign, and he didn't get a letter of recommendation. I have no idea where he ended up, but he gave Becky a goodbye call. They canned me. Oh, it was polite, but I'm gone with no recommendation. I guess this is goodbye. She seemed sympathetic. I'm sorry, Greg, but we brought it on ourselves. At least you're not married. There was silence for a second. Actually, Beck, I am. She's in service in a not-so-nice place right now. She rotates home in three months. You jerk. How could you do that to her? At least Jace is home. Out of danger. I agree. I am a jerk, but I was lonely, bored, and you were agreeable. I'm sorry about all this. You're not going to tell her, are you? No, I have no way of contacting her. But even if I did, she doesn't deserve what I'm going through. Love her hard when she gets back, and don't ever repeat this mistake. I promise. I'm so sorry how it all turned out. I hope you get him back. You're a heck of a woman, Becky. Goodbye. She cried into the phone for several seconds before hanging up. I thought about trying to contact his wife, but in the end, I didn't. She probably needed to know, but if he ran true to type, she'd find out soon enough. Kathy got in contact with Becky, and she jumped all over the chance to talk to me. At her suggestion, she went to three sessions alone first. I think Kathy was trying to prepare her, but she was too stubborn to see it. The big night finally came. I figured she would try to ambush me, so I made it a point to be there thirty minutes early. Becky was really surprised when Kathy collected her from the waiting room and found me already there. Jace, she cried, trying to hug me. Kathy imposed herself between us. Becky, for this to work, you have to give him his space. He's already made it clear he doesn't want any physical contact. If you don't follow the rules I've laid out, he'll leave, and he won't come back. Understand? It took her a few minutes, but she gathered herself and sat down at the table. Becky, listen to me. I know you have things you want to say, and so does Jace. Remember, be calm, be clear, and avoid dramatics. Would you like to go first? She nodded, and we waited. First, I need to apologize, guys. Jace, I know what I did was wrong. You have every right to be angry. I have no excuse. I'm not even sure now why I did it. Was it worth the pain I've been going through? No way in heck would I ever be that stupid again, not for anything. But Kathy has explained to me that being sorry and apologizing won't change a thing. If you can't forgive me, I know I messed up and destroyed a good marriage. What I need to do now is convince you to give me another chance. Will you promise to talk to me? If after we finish these sessions, you still can't forgive me, I'll walk away and not fight the divorce. I looked between her and Kathy. I could see Kathy's hand in this. Maybe those individual sessions had helped after all. I spoke as she was obviously waiting for me to say something. I know that speech took a lot out of you, Beck. I've been thinking about it for the last few days. We've known five couples over the years who split up over betrayal 
and gone to counseling to try to save their marriages. How many made it? I checked. One, Gary and Sherry. They don't cuddle in public. The little touches they used to give each other all the time are gone. It's been two years, and they're still not back to where they were. Could you live like that? Knowing I'd always suspect you if you were gone even for an hour or two. If I automatically tried to verify everything you told me, stopped in your purse, checked your computer and cell phone on a regular basis, I couldn't. She was flinching at my words, like each was a physical blow, but she kept a determined look on her face. If I got a cuddle with you every night in bed, I would do anything and everything I could to reassure you, to show you I've changed, and you could trust me again. I threw up my hands. Ah, there is another of the magic words, trust. Exactly how would you get me to trust you again? You went out when we were dating, lying about it when we hadn't even made a commitment yet. I should have seen it then. Now, years later, after being together for all this time, planning a family, a future, you do it again. Were you lonely this time too? Bored because I was out trying to build a business and a better future for us, and didn't have time to go to dance clubs or out on the town. I was finally letting go of some of the poison, and it felt good. Becky was looking horrified. Kathy stepped in. Our time is up. I want you to do some homework for me before our next meeting. Becky, I want you to think about what Jace said. Tell him in detail how you plan to get him to trust you. Jace, I need you to think about it too. Do you think you can get over your rage and try to rebuild a relationship with Becky? Be honest and clear. That's all. Until next week. Jace, could I see you for just a second before you leave? Good night, Becky. We stood and watched as she went to her car, sitting there for five minutes before pulling out. Kathy looked at me. You're absolutely never taking her back, are you? No, I said sadly. She sighed. I didn't think so. We need to refocus the sessions, get her used to the idea, let her down slowly. If you have any love left for her, break it to her gently. Gently didn't work. We tried, Kathy and I, but she just refused to give up. I tried every way I could think of, and some from Kathy, but I never got her to understand. In the end, I just stopped. You broke your most solemn vow. Becky made it look easy. Even now, I know you regret what came of it, but deep down, I get the feeling you can't see what you did as serious. Where I considered it life-altering, you liken it to spending too much money or wrecking the car, something along those lines. Didn't you feel anything when you did it? She didn't give me a direct answer, as usual. Talk about feelings, you're the one who turned to stone. Give me one more chance, please. How can you sit there with no emotion while I fall to pieces? You still don't get it, do you? There's plenty of emotion inside me. It's emotion, not intelligence, that makes us human. All animals think at some level, but who besides humans feels love, hate, desire? No other species. I've just gotten better at controlling them. I let her talk another thirty minutes before I held up my hand, rising. It's over, Beck. Accept it and move on. Understand, I still love you, but it isn't enough anymore. The divorce is final in four weeks. It's best for both of us. You're still a young, beautiful woman. You'll find someone else. When you do, if you ever get tempted, think of us. You will deserve your best. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, Please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.